a friend we have in Jesus. Let's all stand and sing. Hymn number 354. What a friend we have in Jesus.
column or anybody you think needs to be taken off of the first column. Yes, sir? Uh, Tim Cockrell came through his surgery well and he take them off. Okay. Thank you. Came through his surgery good. Who's that? Tim Cockrell. That's the last name on the first column. Want to mention Tommy Bradley again. Uh, if you all would like at any, any service to give a, a special offering to him, uh, Mary's had to go a lot to the hospital. They've been back and forth a lot, and as we all know, it's everything's more expensive, gas and everything. So, if you like to honor them and to get put in a special offering, if you want to use cash, get get an envelope over there and put his name on it, or if you want to write a check, just in the memo section, put his name on there. I know they would definitely appreciate that. All right, the second column that starts with Miss Madeline Craig. Anything, any news? Yes, ma'am. Crystal Chrisley can come on. Okay. Good. Anyone else in that column? Yes, sir. Uh, Crystal Chrisley. That's the third name in the second column. Came through things good. <clears throat> Anything, anybody else on that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he does. Kenny Dunn can come off. Joey's nephew, Kenny Dunn. Okay, anything else? All right, the third column. Anything from that that needs either deleted or we want to add something or any updates? All righty, the fourth column. Anything from there? Any updates, deletions? And the fifth column. Hey, Byron. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Paul Hyatt, that third column, H Y A T D. Mm -hmm. He's doing okay. Yeah. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you. See a gentleman from Nairs? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is a, he married to a Sue Hyatt? Yes, he is. Yeah. He gave Rachel, she gave Rachel piano lessons for a while. I didn't know. So he's okay. Good folks. All right, anything on the, that whole list that we may have forgotten? Yes, ma'am. Uh, on the beginning there, uh, Tommy Belcher, that's my uncle. He's been in the hospital very serious recently. His whole family needs our prayers. Uh, yeah, family of Tommy Belcher. How did you say he's related to him? I'm sorry. He's my uncle. He, uh, Julie's uncle, Tommy Belcher. He's He's having a very rough time. Pray, keep them in your prayers. <clears throat> Anything else? Anyone else? Yes, sir. I have a place by my tooth today. So I'm at the dentist, and she tells me that the implant is pushing me out. I don't know. Save the liver for him? Well, I, no, not for him, but I do hope that they were able to get it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know there's a way to preserve it now. That's a shame. Gosh. Anybody else? On the back, you got this, our missionaries and uh, the Christian schools. I think they're all rolling again. Pray for all our Christian schools and public schools as well. And just about all of them are back up and rolling again. Well, no, not all of them. Most of them. The teachers are about to roll on the floor. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> just kidding. Is that right, Miss Adair? You're alive. Yeah. All right, anything else? All right, let's... Um, if there's any part of this you'd like to focus on or whatever as we pray. Oh, is there any uh, unspoken requests? Okay. okay. All right. You can, 
anything any one of y'all want to focus on as we pray, you can zero in on that. Dave, would you pray for us, sir? Please. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this beautiful evening for allowing us to be here. Father, we just praise you and give you the glory for everything that you've done for us and everything that we're able to do. We come to you to see the Lord with this prayer list. And first of all, we thank you, Father, for the names that you've come off there. We, you know, it's a very special thing to be able to pray for these people and to see them get better. And we know, Lord, that it's answered prayer and it comes from you. We just thank you and praise you for it. We pray for the people who will miss you. announcements from our bulletin. Um, so uh, on the 27th, this coming Saturday, uh, Caleb Bradley's uh, baby shower is going to take place at noon. Uh, they're going to have some sandwiches. Uh, says here she'd prefer to, you to bring books instead of cards. They're going to have a diaper raffle and win a gift basket uh, registered as Amazon and Target. Uh, the Masters Club downstairs will start back a week from today. August 31st. We're going to have our uh, prayer breakfast, men's prayer breakfast, uh, September 3rd. What day is that on? Saturday. That's a Saturday also. Oh gosh. Tom has no meeting anymore. Uh, that's at 8 o'clock in the morning. Tom doesn't either. Uh, Chase Whitten will be our guest speaker, so come on out to that, gentlemen. Uh, as uh, Dave mentioned in his prayer, our Paul, our Paul revival starts September 4th. That's a Sunday. I know because it's after Saturday. Um, and it lasts through the 7th, through Wednesday. Um, it's going to be, we're going to have some games and activities that Sunday and Monday because that's Labor Day weekend. I think we're going to have a softball game. That are up. Um, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, the... Uh, and then we'll have an afternoon service at Sunday and Monday that week. There won't be a night service. Tuesday and Wednesday, there will be a regular 7 o'clock service in the evening during our revival. Uh, Capital City Blitz in Columbus, Ohio, September 8th through the 10th. See day for that if you're interested in going. And uh, we need to get our church directory updated. So. Uh, let us know. I think there's a sign-up thing out there if you want to update anything on the, the church directory. Okay? Pray for our pastor as he, he's away. He should, we'll be back on Saturday if nothing happens. And I think, is there anything else we need to announce? Yes, sir. I think it's great on the internet. I think that preacher's daughter and her husband is going overseas for a couple weeks. Eh? Yes, sir. We should remember them in prayer. Elizabeth and... Uh, Yeah, but what's her husband's name? Kyle. Kyle. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kyle. Elizabeth and Kyle had a little losing my hair moment there. Uh, they're going on a missions trip to Africa to do some teaching and passing out some tracts and witnessing. And so we need to pray, pray for them for sure. That's a big undertaking and that's a great calling to do that. So keep Elizabeth and Kyle virtual in your prayers. Remember their last one. <laughs> Anything?
anything else. All right, let's stand and shake hands and we'll take the offering. Welcome each other to the service.
Him, that is, How Great Thou Art, one of my favorites. And of course, now I've talked to Jody many times, and you always think of favorite hymns, and someone ever asks you, what's your favorite hymn? And, you got time? So many, so many good ones out there. Well, that is one of the ones that are on that list. How great thou art, beautiful and beautiful. And take our Bibles tonight. We're going to be in the book of Romans, book of Romans, chapter 7. And as you're returning there, take the time and talk to you for a minute. There was a man who was out in his yard, and he saw something under his porch. It was a rattlesnake. So he looked closer, and it really wasn't moving. So he figured, well, he'll go to the shed, get a shovel, and take care of it. So he got and got the shovel. He came back, and sure enough, that thing was still there. It didn't move, and it was really hardly moving. And as he sat there and looked at it, he thought, you know, never really held a live rattlesnake before. And as he kept on with this thought process and looking, he went ahead and just, he decided, no, I'm going to do it. So slowly and carefully, he went ahead and crouched down and he picked up that rattlesnake. And once again, it was barely moving. And he just thought to himself, oh, not that bad. I mean, he understood there was a danger still, but he thought, oh, it's not that bad. He went and he put it back down and decided, you know, I'm not going to do nothing about this right now. And he left it big. Put the shovel up, left it big. Next day, went out, sure enough, it was still there. Still, it was slow moving, but it was still there. A few days, come, and it was the same concept. And just about every day, he would tempt himself, and he would just go over there, and he'd pick that rattlesnake right back up. Never really did anything to him. It never did. It's still slow moving, never trying to bite or nothing. Days turned into weeks, and then turned into a couple months. And he came out one day, and he was working on his porch, and he dropped a tool, Right off the edge of the porch. Without thinking, he went down there, grabbed the tool, and right away, that rattlesnake got him. Got him good. I said it to say tonight, how comfortable are you with your sin? How comfortable are we, I include myself in this, how comfortable are we with our sin? The book of Romans, chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 8 through 13. Follow along with me as I read. The Bible says, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived in me. It was to be revived, and I died. In the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me, but that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly, as we exceed, exceeding sinful. Let's pray this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be with our pastor, Lord, now as he's away from us, and wherever he, wherever he may be tonight, if he's uh, able to be to a church service, if preaching right now in church service, Lord. And I just pray you be with him and his family. And uh, I ask you to be with all the Sunday school, all the uh, workers tonight, all the teachers tonight, the teens and little, little children, Lord, that you will be with them, Lord, as they are teaching. God, I ask you, Lord, to be with me as uh, you've 
given me this from your word, Lord. I pray that you will be able just to use me and speak through me tonight, however you see fit. And that, above all, Lord, we know that your word will not return void. I ask you to use me, Lord. Be with us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I gave that little example, a little story, right before I read uh, Romans chapter 7, because my points are going to kind of go along right along with it. And it's very true. The more and more, I'm sure, really all of us can say, those of us who have been saved for any length of time, you meet other Christians. And that's a great thing. You know, the Bible you know, tells us we need to fellowship with one another. And I've had the privilege of uh, you know, being members of a few different churches or working on staff at a few different churches. Within that, there's something very particular I saw. And I got to know, I got to know several preachers, and just so on and so forth. This is as much as everybody, I understand. But one thing I got to really realize, that I want to ask, is how can Christians get so comfortable with sin? How can Christians get just so comfortable with sin? And I pondered on that, and the Lord is... One of those things of, you know, the Bible says, you know, about the beam mile and eye, he quickly showed me that, well, you're comfortable with a few things. So and this is what he used to show me, and I want to share it with you tonight, is number one, we ponder our sin. Oh, so we pander our sin. We pander our sin. We take it lightly. And now, I think we all understand, you know, there's certain, if we want to class, say, you know, we classify sins, you know, a sin is a sin. It's still wrong. And just as much if, remember this illustration, just as much if you stole a penny off your dad's dresser or if you stole a million dollars in the bank, that same sin is going to send you to hell. It doesn't matter. The consequence will be different. But the actual sin itself is still a sin. But for some reason, we like to go, we like to go ahead and categorize sin. Go, you know, oh, this is this sin here, yeah, but no, everyone does this. And it's just part of, well, it's part of our sin nature, you know. And then over here, it's a, I can't believe that would be allowed. But realistically, there's no difference, as in a sin is still a sin. I understand there's a difference in consequences, so on and so forth. We can get to that. But we take sin so lightly. We have this, sometimes we, we, we think of this attitude, and we hear people say this all the time of, you know, well, there was only one time. Or the one that the Lord personally dealt with me a lot about is, well, there's only a few curse words in that movie. Or, well, there's only really one not so good scene. Or, maybe there's a, a, on a TV show or whatever, you, or whatever on the TV that maybe it's an it immodest scene. And I was thinking, for many preachers talk about immodesty and, and things and how it's always going to be a struggle and I understand that. It is our, it's our flesh and it's our sin nature. It doesn't mean fright, but it's our sin nature. And I agree, and I'm saying I'm against it. I'm against certain Im immodesty. You know, I'm, I'm against that. I need to be modest. <coughs> but yet I put on display in my living room. Not think twice about it. Oh, it's just for the movie will be over, or, or let's go ahead and let's fast forward that part. It's still sin. But we want to take it and put it so quickly, <coughs> in a sense. We try to justify our own sin. In Scripture here, what I just read to you, it talks about how once living without the law, without the law, and then this command, command came in. This commandment. And this commandment was actually greater than the law, which is referring to that great salvation the Lord has provided for us. But we see throughout Scripture, and if I'm remembering correctly, I believe in 1 Timothy. Turn there. Tell me if I'm not going to say it correctly. 
Yes, 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to look at verse... Let's look at verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinner, for unholy and profane, for murderers of, of fathers, and murderers of mothers, and manslayers, and it continues to go. And it says, uh, it continues to go there, and then verse 11 says, according to the glorious gospel of the, uh, the Lord, excuse me, of the blessed God, which is, which was committed to my trust. And so that's all about contrary to sound doctrine. So it's listing all these things. That's who the law was written for. The law was for that. The law wasn't for necessarily righteous men, but it does keep righteous men honest. And if you, I'm not sure if you ever heard that term. I'm sure you have. But the, but the commandment, even though our salvation, yes, we are freed from that law. We are given grace. But what we read here in Romans chapter 7 is we need not let that deceive us of being under that grace being forgiven. Yes, everything is under the blood. Everything is washed away. Everything is forgiven. Praise the Lord. But sometimes, I think we like to use that as an excuse. We like to think, uh, maybe not vocalize it, but maybe somewhere in the back of our mind, we're like, oh, maybe not the best thing to do, but I know the Lord will forgive me for it. Have you ever had a thought like that? I know I have. I've had a thought like that. That's us pandering our sin. That's us taking that sin lightly, justifying it. Secondly, we see we presume, we're presume in our sin, which we are taking it for granted. We get used to it. We no longer start hearing those curse words in those TV shows. They just, it's like, it's like they're numb towards it. We don't know, notice people being dressed anymore. Our eyes become numb to it. We use, we have the thought of, well, I must be doing okay because God's still using me. Or sometimes we even have the thought of, well, not as bad as what I used to be. It could be worse. We start taking it for granted. We start getting used to it. We start becoming so numb to it. I always think of, I remember when Titus was little. Bless his heart, he had so much energy. And when he first started walking, he was going. He was going everywhere. And I never forget when the first times he was going and going and <laughs> ran right into a wall. Bless his heart. <laughs> Falls right down. And of course he's crying and he's going to make sure he's all right. Well, guess what? A few days later, there he is going again. He's playing, he's going around, and <laughs> hits that wall. He doesn't cry. He falls, and he goes, <laughs> he'll see who noticed. And if no one noticed, he's fine. But if someone saw, oh, and he's going to start crying and wailing. See, he's, he developed very quickly that toughness about him. Oh, it didn't hurt that bad. Well, sometimes we can do that with our sin. Oh, well, it wasn't that bad. Oh, it's, yeah, I know, but it's okay. Or it's one of those, no one noticed. I'll be okay. And it's so easy to do that. Trust me, I, well, everything I'm saying tonight, I am guilty of myself. I am. We have to be so careful. Here in the book of Romans, Paul is telling us that he was under the law. He had a life without the law. He was under the law. And then now, with being that commandment, now that he's saved. But yet, that sin, that being, having that can deceive him. It can deceive us. 
We have to be so careful that just like my story in the beginning. See, that man, when he, he first saw that snake, the first thing, and we, it's, it's funny, we actually see it all throughout Scripture, he looked. And it wasn't like a, he saw it and, oh, God, go get that. God, go take care of that. No, he looked and then started thinking. He just looked at it more. Well, it's not that bad. I could, it's moving so slow. I could fit to go to fight me. I could probably put it down before I could really notice. That looking is different. You see, in the Garden of Eden, he looked. She looked at that fruit, saw it was good to eat. David looked at Bathsheba. It's all throughout Scripture. Look. It's, all, it's that first thing. And that's always what draws you in. You know, we always uh, talk about you know a beer commercial. They always show this great time everyone's having, and, you know, having this fantastic time and partying, having a great time with friends. What they don't show is the person, you know, hugging the toilet at the end of it. What they don't show is the person thinking, oh, yeah, that was a great time last night. What'd you do? I don't know. I can't remember, but it was fun. Mm, sounds like it. One time when we look and it intrigues us, and then we go to that next step after looking, starting, and then we get so used to it. It just become we take it for granted for what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> and now I'm saying all these things tonight. Maybe this is not something that you are having a hard time with. Praise the Lord. But what about what you're setting for your children, right. your grandchildren? Amen. Because as we're fixing to get to here. Sin never just falls on you, hardly ever. We pay for it one day. We stand for God one day. We all go for our own sin, for our own actions, for our own thoughts, all that. But it never just affects you. Next, we palliate our, the sin. We palliate the sin. Which palliate is talking about to, it's basically the definition is to make a disease less than what it is without removing the cause. So often, I always think of, you know, so often, you know, the kid cleaning their room. Yeah, I cleaned it. And when you open that closet door, clean's not the word I'd use. It's all just shoved in there, right? Or sweeping under the door. We know all these different sayings. What, or maybe these things that have happened that you, you we know what that, what that's talking about. Is we're making it look to be okay. Without actually taking away the cause. But the problem is of why that room is dirty. Same thing in our lives. A great example here we see in the Bible, it, I believe, is in 1 Samuel. We see King Saul. I see King Saul, he was going to war, and God told him that he would give him the victory. And when he did, he was to kill all the Amalekites. He was told to kill them all. He said, and the Bible tells us, God told us, God told him everything. He said, they're oxen, they're sheep, everything. Kill everything, take everything out. So, God gives Saul the victory. And what does he do? He takes the best of the cattle, the best of the sheep, the women, the best of the children, and even the king, and takes them with him. Doesn't kill him, like God told him to. I'm sure in his head, that's enough. I did enough. I took care of the problem. It was good. There's no reason to go on destroying the rest of it. Then we come to second sin. I believe. I may have had that wrong, by the way. And when Saul dies, he's in battle. There's a young man coming towards him, and what we all know, he falls on a sword. That young man is asked who he is, and he says, I can't remember his name specific. I can't remember his name, but he says, it's an hmm. hmm. 
See, Saul ended up making the situation a lot less than what it really was. He didn't follow it all the way through. He was trying to sweep it under the rug in a sense. Trying to make it better than it was. We could say the same thing with David and Bathsheba. He had the same, he had the same concept. Well, I'll, I'll take care of this problem. We'll do it quietly. No one will know. Hmm. I think he paid for it. Sword never left the house. Like I said, if we think about just fast forwarding the bad parts, or uh, I always think of this one. This one being because it hit close to home for me. I think of, I hear parents. Well, you know, my child, they don't, they don't listen to that music. They don't listen to the wrong music. They don't listen to um, rap music. I'm going to go ahead and call it what it is. They don't, they don't listen to it. They listen to Christian rap. Oh, put a Christian in front of it. It means it's okay. Good. I'm glad you said that. I was nervous. How often that happens. I promise you. Now, I'm not doing a lesson on music tonight, but I promise you, music affects you so much more than what you can ever think. The Bible tells us, Colossians chapter 3, 16, from the words of Christ, dwelling originally and always in teaching and admonishing one another, in what? In psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace and hearts of the Lord. Psalms teach you. How do kids learn their ABCs? By a song. Music teaches you. So guess what? When you're listening, or when your kids, when your grandkids are listening to that, I'm going to call what is again, junk, going in their ears. It's teaching them. That person that rap song is talking about being a womanizer, robbing, killing, stabbing, murdering, all that stuff, doing drugs. Oh yeah, great example. Teaching them a lot too. Mm -hmm. And look at the world we live in today. Amen. Mm. I'm, sure, I'm sure we can all talk about people that we know that got involved in drugs, that got involved in something in them in a way like that. Just saying, not to say this is the cause, but I guarantee you they weren't doing drugs going down the, going down the road listening to hymns. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking about music, though. Then lastly, we see, just like that man, decided just to leave that rattlesnake alone. He's just going to leave it alone. It is what it is. He's going to let it be. And lastly, what always happens, the bite. The bite. Book of Luke, chapter 12. Book of Luke, Luke chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible says, Jesus is speaking here, it says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid. That shall not be known. No. Nothing at all. Good or bad. Nothing is secret. And it shall be revealed. Your sin will always be known. Eventually. Eventually your sin will be known. I heard a preacher when he said, uh, when I learned about you know, your sin, will, you know, I'm not, I'm not for a preacher to say this. I mean, your sin will, you will be known. And he said, you can be known as in you're confessing it and maybe using it as an example, using it as an illustration to help someone else. Or you're confessing it because now you got caught. Your sin will be known. Your sin will find you out. Your sin doesn't just affect you. It affects those around you, your family, your friends, church family. We have story after story after story throughout Scripture of men, women, people throughout Scripture. Their sin never affected just them. It never did. I think of my personal one, I always think of, because I just, I just can't fathom how it would be, is April. In the book of Joshua, Achan took that Babylonian garment, which was, uh, it was 
with, with a wedge of gold and so many pieces of silver. And that was the accursed thing. God said, leave it. That's it. It's from Jericho. He took it, hid it in his camp, under his tent, in his camp. They went up against Ai, the children of Israel went up against Ai, and they lost. They retreated. And Joshua is wondering, what, what happened, Lord? You told me you were going to give us the victory. And he said, there's sin in the camp. So here comes Joshua going through all the tribes, going through, finding out where the sin is, and he comes to Ai. Achan confesses. He took the accursed thing. He was punished. They took all he had, destroyed it all, and they were stoned, his family. Now, the stone that took place in, historically at this time in the scripture was not everyone standing around with stones and stoning him. They had a big stone, you put your head on it, they had a bigger stone, and they dropped it. That's what happened. The Bible tells us that he had daughters and sons. We don't know how many. We know there's it's plural, so we know at least two. And how this would have happened, Joshua would have been last. His wife would have been second to last. His children would have been first. Youngest to oldest. And I always think, can you imagine Joshua, I mean, excuse me, Achan, standing there, watching his children one by one, Die because of something he did. Because of his sin. He knew it was wrong. But guess what? Just like in the Garden of Eden, just like with David, he looked and he saw the good that it could have profited him. I don't know, maybe he was in financial trouble. Maybe he needed I don't know. I don't know why he needed to take it. But what I do need to know, what the Bible tells me, he had to watch. Son, daughter two, son two, and his wife. Now you use your own imagination. I'll paint you a picture of mine. <clears throat> Who knows how old they were? I know the kind of face that Titus sometimes gives me when he's scared. And those of you who have children, you know what I mean. That face your child will give you when they're scared. They're scared about something. You can see it in their eyes. And you try to encourage them to be brave, be brave. Maybe something so silly and simple. But to them, it's this big thing. Can you imagine Aiken looking at his child as her child gets their head put on that stone? Tears swelling up in their eyes. And just looking at their daddy. Older ones may be shouting, wondering why, what's happening. And I can imagine his wife closing her eyes, not even able to look at it. She just had to witness her children die too. Your sin never only affects you. People always get affected. A lot of times, that's what hurts the most. But I promise you, it's so true. So tonight, my question and my challenge to you is why as Christians have we gotten so comfortable with sin? Have we, just like in the book of Romans, Paul tells us, we just like him, we, we deceive ourselves for certain things. I know of people, good Christian people, I love them. And we've had conversations, and they'll tell me, you know, I just, I don't want to be looked at as that Christian. What do you mean, that Christian? Biblical one? But so many times, that whatever excuse can be given, what I was thinking 
the story of Abraham. Sin never just affects you. So tonight, I'm asking you, in Psalm, chapter 120, the 129th Psalm, 139th Psalm, excuse me, just as David asked the Lord, I'm asking you to ask the Lord tonight. 139th Psalm, verses 23 and 24, the Bible says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Christian, I'm here to tell you tonight, brother and sister, I'm here to tell you tonight, let God show you. Let God show you. He, he knows. He's the only one that's going to know. Let God show you. And deal with Him. Talk with Him. Just like a loving Father. His arms are wide open. He's a perfect gentleman. He's waiting for you to come to Him. Challenge you tonight, Christian. Ask Him. Search Him. Show me. Something in me. Something I need to do different as a father. Something I need to do different as a husband. As a wife. As a mother. Grandfather. Grandmother. You put your label to it. What do you have me to do? Search me. Show me. Let's stand and let's pray this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples, Lord, you've given us. Lord, as you've shown us in Romans chapter 7, God, about how so easy and so easily deceive ourselves in thinking, oh, we're not that bad. So easy to deceive ourselves and, well, if this isn't right, then at least I know that God will forgive me for it. Instead of just finding out it's right. Instead of asking you for it. God, I pray, Lord, that you be able to use your word tonight, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you know, we do this time of invitation, Lord, that you'll be able to use it to only glorify you, only, Lord, draw your children closer to you, God. I pray. Search me, Lord. If you have your hymn, I want you to turn to hymn number 394. 394. The altar is open. As the piano plays, I want you to sing. The altar is open.
that's not just a search. You know, so many times, it, I found it for myself, it, it doesn't hurt to arrest God to search you. And he'll show you something even when you didn't know it was there anymore. Because that means, just means you're drawing that much closer. Thank you for being here tonight. I pray you uh, have a safe ride home and safe week. Is after your Sunday. Do be praying for our pastor. As he's doing this, I know I talked to him on the phone. He, I think we all know why he's up there, but his great aunt that passed away. And, uh, he's going to be preaching that service and doing that service. So pray for him. I believe the service is going to be uh, Friday. Tomorrow is the, uh, the week, the visitation time. So we do pray for pastor that the Lord's able to use him and to be with the family as well. So let's go ahead and we'll be dismissed this evening. And uh, Kevin King, pray for us this evening. Dear Lord, thank you for another day you've been in your house, Lord. Thank you for the message that we've heard here tonight, Lord. And please convict our hearts and help us through our natures of sin that we've become used to, Lord. Please be with all the kids as they go back to school. Please be with the pastor and his family as they travel, Lord. And just please continue to lead and guide